Thank you to everyone who's come back. I suspect there was a bit of a queue for refreshments, so um, folks can come and go as they please. I'm now um, very pleased to invite um, Isaac Beale to manage our speakers for our first case study, the impacts of agriculture in the Brigalow Belt bioregion. We have a mix of people who are able to be here today and a couple of folks via technology, um, but we will work that out. So over to you, Isaac. Thank you so much. To begin our case on the impacts of agriculture in the Brigalow Belt bioregion, initially we'd like to call Warren Saunders, please. Yay. Thank you again, um, and uh, yeah, if you if you were happy to introduce yourself again, that would be great. Just a short version is fine too. <laughs> um, yeah, Warren Ganter or Saunders, and I'm a Gungri man from the Maranau River. I was born at Mitchell and grew up in Roma and Toowoomba, and I've always uh, been bushwalker and. Used to go shooting and yabbing and things when we were kids and riding around, just anything to get out in the bush. And uh, and then I've gone moved to Canberra. I joined the army. I think I told you I got paid for crawling around the bush, getting yelled at. But the army was pretty good. Taught you how to get up when you got kicked down. Um, and then I've been in the environment department. I've had been a landscaper. I'm a native plant bush tucker sort of expert and track down plants, cover dirt wherever it might be, but I've done a lot of agricultural projects, agroforestry work, saltbush crops, we, we get seed together, kangaroo grass and microlina and wallaby grass put into pasture mixes, could do tree belts on properties, driveways, and, and a lot of wetlands too, there's tailings, dams around dumps and councils, and then we're also doing a lot of work in subdivisions, and these days the subdivisions tend to get their trendy wetland, which we did a lot of work for. Um, and uh, so at the bottom of the, the new developments these days, they have a, a trendy wetland down there, um, and we, we do a lot of planting in those. And um, then dogs can run in there, and, but it catches all the effluent that comes off the suburb. And uh, that we got a lot of, in Canberra, we got a lot of support there because it was taking a while to get the council to do it, but the, um, property owners and developers um, found that a wetland nearby actually put property prices up, and uh, we've got a lot of support from the Adelaide Council and the Albury Council because they have to clean, clean all the salt out of uh, the water coming down the river. That's Canberra's the biggest uh, polluter of the Murray-Darling, oh, the, of the um, Murray River. Probably a bit more polluters up the stream as well. But yeah, it's a big polluter. And so um, that saved them millions of dollars once we put these wetlands in so that um, they weren't cleaning up all that effluent. Thank but uh, we're going to talk about the Brigalow Belt, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> but I was just going to ask you the initial question, if that's all right. This morning, we're focusing on the Brigalow Belt bioregion, and I just wanted to ask you how, in your opinion, European colonisation and agri industrial agriculture has affected access to country and communities and First Nations cultural practices. Yeah, um, sure. Um, well, I'd like to just say a bit first about... Uh, we've got the, our maps up there. Oh, OK. It's me in the nursery. Cultural... Yeah, OK. Um, the Gungri people have lived in the, on the Maranau region and its tributaries for a very long time. It, um, it's in the central Queensland, I don't know if you know the Maranau River, but up the top is sort of Carnarvon Gorge and the river goes quite straight down to St George and it's uh, quite an unusual river because it's almost a river that there's so much sand that it's eroded, it's created its own banks. So the river goes quite straight, it uh, goes down a ridge, the r river is that big. And, um, and so as it, as it goes down, it shifted a lot of sand and soil, and that, that's changed the topography of the district. Um, and we are a bit further west out there, so it's getting onto a semi-arid desert sort of country, so we don't get quite the weed issues. A lot of weeds out there, they get into disturbed areas. Weeds and ferals are very much a sign of um, you know, human activity, roads and digging things up, because when you get into the, the solid, hard bush, um, there's not... It's very hard for um, exotic things to grow in there. They will get in there, but, um, you know, the, the Australian climate and the soil starts to sort it out, and even the animals. We've got a lot of uh, eagles out there that eat the rabbits and the foxes and the cats. But further towards the coast, they, they probably get a bit more of a com comfortable lifestyle. Mind you, we've still got problems out there. There's camels and prickly pears, and there's all, we've got enough weeds out there as buffalo grass, although they buy buffalo grass. <laughs> 
don't know why. Um, um, so the river is um, a bit unusual in, in itself. Um, and our people have been living a semi-nomadic lifestyle there, moving from seasonal food and water to the next. And uh, we had large permanent camps around our districts, along the rivers, near water sources and billabongs. And uh, they're often about a days apart, walk apart, so you can move up to the next next uh, billabong and that. We've got a a uh, song line through our, a trade route, song line through our district that goes up through the river. So if you want to get across Australia, you've got to get onto the song song lines, the like highways, and travel through it. And our district um, at the top of it is Carnarvon Gorge. Now, if you look at your maps, Google Earth is fantastic. If you look at Carnarvon Gorge, it's almost it's been referred to as the roof of Australia or the the top because it's not as high as Kosciuszko, but from that bit of land up in Carnarvon Gorge, a big rivers come off it. So the top of our country, we're the top of the um, Murray Darling Basin, but once you go over the hill, the river is Belliando or something goes up to Townsville. So Burdekin and the Fitzroy catchments, big catchments come off the other side of Carnarvon Gorge, and then out to the end of it, the water goes out to Cooper's Creek and Lake Eyre. And, and into the Peru catchment. So that little strip of country on the Carnarvon Gorge, it's on the Great Dividing Range, waters from there spread all across the country. And so in the old days, you'd have to come up there, do special ceremony or get permission, uh, depending on your business, and for you to pass over to go somewhere. So you've got, and you've got to marry outside your, your tribe. You've got to move around. So um, we had... Uh, you know, a lot of trade and people went through our, through our district quite a bit. Um, and today, many of us still live and regularly visit our home country and our, our family ties are very strong. Uh, we do have a modern lifestyle now and we're not as dark as we used to be. Uh, but, and we've got jobs and, we, and, you know, modern people, but we do have a connection con to country. Um, and it's been especially so since we had successful land title claims, uh, the Gungaris. We're about the second biggest claim, so we've, that's done a stack for the district. And we've got strong committees who organise activities and uh, strong advocates in the city who represent us. So our tribe's been done quite well, I think. We've been we kept quite strong through connection to land and country. Um, now, we've got some of the... I've got a lot of good photos of good country and bad up here. So I'll go back to the start a bit. This is the nice country up at Carnarvon Gorge. It was all National Park and had some livestock in there and burning and that. There's been a lot more burning since Europeans have turned up. You, you might not think so, but overall, much more burning. Um, this is uh, one of our big camps, was at the Three Rivers Junction, Amby Creek, Wamalilla Creek and, and the Maranoa River. And they all join within 100 metres of each other. So it's very rare geologically to get three rivers on flat country meet up at the one spot. It's a really unusual place. Mind you, look at all the sand being brought down. In the old days, it would have been rockier. There's always been sand along the river, but there's a lot more rockier and big billabongs. And you know, a lot of this agriculture has filled up the river. There's so much sand, all the billabongs, they're not as deep, they're filled in. There are big billabongs off to the side of this, though, because the Wamalilla and the Ambi Creek are a bit more natural and come out a bit more clay country, more, less than sand. Um, so they've got beautiful big permanent billabongs on both sides of there. You can see the creek, Wamalilla is on the left there coming in. Uh, so um, it's, a, it's an unusual catchment. <coughs> uh, now, we're, with um, our land use, we're always centred around water. You've got to drink, you've got to wash, but water always has lots of food sources, um, fish, eggs and birds and things and plants I mentioned before. And um, modern agriculture likes that water. A lot of water gets taken out of this river. Further down is Cubby Station. It's a massive place doing cotton and rice and things. So a lot of water is taken out. And uh, modern agriculture and industry uses a stack of water, more than what you're gonna, ever going to drink. Um, so the, there's a big impact on uh, the water resources. Um, We'll go to the next, next picture, I think. Oh, here we are looking at uh, some scar trees here. Uh, this, yeah, a lot of the agriculture that our tribe had was to do with the land. You know, it, 
we've got seasonal things to do. We walk from resources to the next. We, uh, we protect things into the future. And <coughs> we didn't really dig things up because it wasn't the requirement to make mega bucks. What, what was that, all that money going to do you? I think, I think that way a bit these days even. It doesn't always bring you that much happiness. So, you know, we, our communities are strong and all those, those sort of things we, we enjoy about being together. Um, this is up at the top of the catchment. Keep going because these are all sort of natural areas that I've taken. Here's some cattle there in, in the park. And natural country is pretty easy to walk through. Um, it's got patches through it. It's got a crosswalk. It's got a mosaic. It's got bands through it. It's not a monoculture. It's just a one thing. And when you look at them on the maps, you can't see that, that same structure except lots of squares or circles. Uh, keep going. The, the fire. We've got the little movie of the fire. might work. So fire is a big part of the district because things burn. Um, now, this fire was lit, and lit accidentally. Someone was burning their toilet paper. <laughs> not me. Not me. Um, and, but it sort of took off quite tamely. Uh, it didn't take it too long, really, but it's quite natural for the fire to burn through the district. Brigalade country like, just loves going up. And like, you only got to put a flame down there and you've got to put it out. Woof, it just keeps spreading. So when it gets dry up there, it's very hard to control. And when it gets wet, oh, it's so much water. The grass is so tall. So you can, just, you can get out there and just see green countryside going for miles, um, like English countryside. And then other times it all goes grey and starts turning to dirt. So the country can change quite quickly. Um, this is all sort of rocky country. I think a lot of goats have gotten into this area. It's all stony. Uh, but I think a few rabbits were up in amongst that. But the plant there that I took the photo of is, uh, is a cancer-curing bush that our tribe uses and other tribes called maroon bush. It's a bit hard to find, but um, I eat a leaf a day if I can. And uh, it has got quite amazing powers. It was used by the Western Australian Department of Health years ago for cancer patients. But unfortunately, it got taken away because it might have been too good. So there is a bit of an attack on indigenous sort of remedies and that sort of thing. So hopefully, we're hoping that's one of the plants that we'd like to see get out there eventually. The Scavola spinescens. It's got a nice little berry on it too that you can eat. Um, so there's a lot of very good plants that are out there just get quite forgotten about. Um, these are uh, some of the soaks that are around our district. They're just in the middle of the bush. You'll find these little springs come up. But this one's got a very important plant called old man weed. Um, it's from Centipeta um, Cunningham. And it's now used for a lot of skin preparations. It was a bit of a cure-all for us. You just crush it up. It's very, it's got thymol in it. And, but these days, the Chinese are putting it into a lot of skin preparations. And I think in Australia, too, you can get skin preparations from old man weed. It works quite well. It's got a lot of uses. Um, this is just some area along, along the river. You know, have got a lot of old... A lot of old trees. These trees are all keeping the water table down. The, you know, the farmers, good farmers, do want their trees and their property. You need shade for your stock. Um, here's, yeah, that's a bit of the cool burn up at Mount Moffat. And um, we've got here permanent billabong. This is a natural area. Shame it's not such a good, can't see it so well. But there are some beautiful billabongs, permanent things. And a lot of the old properties are based around these billabongs because they didn't really run out of water. But unfortunately, modern agriculture, the water's brown, browner. This creek wasn't too bad. This is Nabeen Creek, which is to the west of Maranao River. But it's still got water going through it. It's a bit cleaner, but it's dirty still because of agriculture and stock getting down to it. So that was a bit of the history of um, our country as well. When the first people to turn up there were drovers, and they, they just took off into the bush, and off they went with their big herds of stock. And they weren't too bad because we traded with them and they tended to, you know, there's only one of them, they weren't very powerful, so they tended to do what they were told when they turned up. Um, but they did cause issue by fouling up billabongs. We didn't mind eating their cattle and sheep either. And, uh, and, uh, but they did start fouling up the billabongs and water resources and there were a few conflicts there because they'd turn up to your billabong and run the cows through it. Um, they're also quite interested in our women. And a lot of social problems were started up when they first came along. And they brought diseases with them and, and you know, and different attitudes. Um, but then after that, 
there was uh, <coughs> large pastoral leases were sold off in England and Sydney and Brisbane, so the land got cut up, but it was sold off site. So then all the pastoralists turned up and, hey, where's my property? And we've got uh, blackfellas out here and, and, uh, and Irish drovers. We don't want that. So they um, started putting up the fences, cutting down the trees, and there was a, probably a 10 or 12 year war between the settlers and, and our, or more so the mobs nearest, a man in Danji, Kuma, Bidjara, Yemen and others. We sort of stayed a bit away from it, but we were definitely, we were part of the, the fighters who were fighting even further down at Moree and places like that. And they might come back to our country and regroup. So it was quite a bit of a war going on. Um, we had white people on our side as well. But uh, our mob did turn up to some places and kill all the blackfellas as well. So the line started to get blurred. And um, once the war finally did get up to us, we sort of went to work. You know, the old days were well and truly over by about the 1870s and the modern world had turned up. So, but we try and stay in, in our own area. We've got a lot of our people still there and our descendants um, still there caring and looking after the country. Um, also, as time went by, um, forestry and mining started up. Uh, more so these days in the, in the 20th century, they've got the cypress, timber, and hardwoods as well, and a lot of railway sleepers were built from the hardwoods out there, poplar box and iron bark, and they wanted the cypress pine because termites don't eat cypress pine, so a lot of houses in Queensland and around the place have got cypress pine. Um, so forestry, but it's not quite the impact compared to agriculture. And there's also mining, a lot of gas mining now, and uh, there's coal and, and, and things like that, and petrol and oil, whatever they... So that's mostly it, and some gem, gemstones as well, but they're not quite the big impact as agriculture. Um, and with modern equipment and chemicals, you know, cropping began. Large-scale wheat, corn and barley and other grains, and that's when, you've got, that's when the system with cultivate it and, and put down fertiliser and stuff. And I was studying at um, Gatton Ag College for a year, just turned up to learn stuff, whatever lecture I wanted to go to, and one of the lecturers did tell us one day, the soil is just there to make plants stand up. Everything else we can do. <laughs> well, yeah, for a while until the, the dirt starts to turn to acid or something else. And then you, what are you going to do then? Well, go to hydroponics or something, or aquaponics. So it's a big waste of resources, really. You know, so much has been wasted in this, this country. And uh, for a fellow like me, I just, every when I walk around, I just see, see stuff in the bush. There's, um, I'm, I'm a seed collector, so when I look at a gum tree, I can see two or three grand worth of seed on that tree, whereas a farmer is going to chop that down to set up $10 worth a wheat. So I had been on a property once, and there was, was all this kangaroo grass, which we sell for you know, up to $500, $600 a kilo, and he was going to cut all that. And, we, and he said, oh, can we get that? He said, yeah, yeah, but I'm going to knock all that down next year to put in um, some barley for something. So he was about to get rid of, well, we're looking at a big $300,000 of kangaroo grass out there. <laughs> and, and he was about to get rid of it for a, some bodgy crop at um, Kuma, at uh, Breadbow. So uh, we tried to get in his ear. So, yeah, there's a fair bit of money in, in, um, ag in native crops, and that's something that I've very much been interested in, bush foods, you know, salt bushes. And there are big crops out there, macadamias, tea tree oil, um, and there, there are other ones out there, you know, Australian products, you know, especially... Um, fish, you know, prawns and barramundi, you know, it's all bush tucker and, and oysters. And there's some pretty big industries based around Australian food. Um, uh, <coughs> look at a couple more photos. Regrowth, we've got this um, property down there where my great great grandfather had, Woodland Station, getting towards St George. Um, there's a fouled up billabong that's on the property. They're not, they've got a pretty good property. Uh, they're sort of family-owned properties, a big difference. Most farmers I come across, we do a lot of work with them and they're very keen on looking after their properties. Um, they're moving over to holistic farming and permacultural ideas and crop rotations and all these sort of things if, if they can get, get themselves organised enough to do it. But uh, the, the corporate farms are run by the stock exchanges and the futures people. So I went to a property at Tamora and... Uh, there's a beautiful old house homestead there, and inside are a bunch of lads in their 20s, some of them less than that, 
The room's covered in tins and Bundy rum bottles. And they just get rung up to go out and put in a crop of something. And, and their crop, cropping is determined by stock exchange and the futures people that they were tied in with. So they said, oh, they put in wheat, and they said, oh, it's the dumbest idea going, but the bosses have told us to put it in. Because statistically, they're putting crops in Argentina, or Australia, all around the world, and they're gambling on all these crops. And as a package, something's going to come out of this. And so it's um, very much cropping done by stock exchange sort of stuff. And I think that's a big, big part of the issue. Is they, they got the money just to, oh, clear it like nothing else. The smaller farmers aren't quite geared up. They're working with the land and trying to use their, their native plants. And in our district, a lot of the properties do run on, our nat on native pasture and stuff because it's um, more arid uh, in, our, in our area. It's pretty hard to rely on water to get a decent crop going. There's not many wheat fields out there. There's some cotton. Cotton's a bit tougher. Um, but there is, there's big paddocks for feed like so, um, uh, Milo and other things. Uh, got some other photos. Here's a river. Yeah, that's all the effect of agriculture. All the river's been choked up with sand, so it's harder to get the water. So that's, that's hard for the property owners. They've got to sink bores now to get out the water. Um, this is overgrazing. Not such a good picture, but yeah, once it really starts to get smashed like that, nothing will grow on it. So if you, you put the stock in, and here's the one, this is probably the worst one I found at Nabeen Creek. Uh, this area is a... Uh, it's a reserve. There's lots of camping reserves in, in Queensland and a lot of the camping reserves are on old stock routes and a lot of them are based on tri old tribes' camps. So a lot of these um, camping reserves are around our tribes' camps around the billabongs. And you can and see on the maps of all these camping reserves about days walk apart and they're often where we, we were because there were tracks going to them too. So the early settlers just set, decided to make these camping grounds and, but what happens to these camps is everyone thinks they own them out there. So they just, everyone just puts a stock through. So you just cut a, cut a hole in the fence and, oh, whoopsie, um, me, me stock went through the other side. Oh, sorry, mate, I'll come over and get them. So there's a lot of lost paddocks, absentee landholders. There's paddocks out there owned by, you know, Baron Bron, somebody from somewhere who hasn't been there for 40 years. And so everybody just cuts the fence and let them go through there. And same with um, crown land and places. So there's a lot of dodgy stuff goes on at times um, with moving fences around and, and cutting holes through things. And, um, and so they're uh, quite at opposition. Some of the properties are very nervous about each other. And um, the other one is goats. Um, goats weren't worth money, but now goats you can get $15 for or something. So one of the property was, properties I was at um, had uh, the goats... Um, were running around, he was worried about the neighbours cutting the fence to steal his feral goats. <laughs> so he was encouraging feral goats because he had 5,000 of them up there and that was 15, 5,000, that was 70 odd thousand bucks he was going to get. And he was, he was very nervous about me being there and telling, and he, telling anybody about his goats. So you get different property owners, I must say. Um, yeah, loss of biodiversity, soil erosion, Salinity, I think the other speaker has spoken a bit about it. I have to wind up now, don't I? <laughs> okay. Are, are, are we done? I think we're done. That's that the was, worst. That's awesome, Warren. Thank that you. And that is, that's awful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Warren. Is there any questions from the panel, please? I have one. Anyone else? Um, thank you, Warren. That was a really excellent overview of both <laughs> life before and after some of the grazing came in. Um, can you just let, uh, let us know a little bit more? You said that the rivers are now filled in and they're not as deep as they used to be. And I've heard other people say that the water wasn't always brown, but my generation or many others perhaps, all we ever see when we go bush to the creeks we love, they're brown. What, is that from cattle and stock coming down? That's what I hear, but... Well, it's, it's a bit natural um, in, in places, mm. but um, when the water starts getting salty, um, it starts to suspend solids. You get sodic soils. So as soil gets salty, especially at places of Wagga, the ground has become saltier because of all this um, agriculture. The salt's always been there as well, but the agriculture's brought the water tables up. And once um, water soil becomes sodic, it becomes melty soil. So you get a bit of clod, you put it in water, and if it goes, it splays apart, you've got sodic soil. And so it suspends particles, the saltiness. So that's why a lot of them have got that, that um, brownness about them. Um, it is a little bit natural. 
but in the old days it would have been more black water from all the tea trees. So mm. when you find natural good creeks, and you do find them out there, you get this black looking water. Mm. And that's, that's, that's a good sign. So the brown stuff is, is not natural, no. Yeah. And once upon a time, because uh, even some of my uncles, great uncles, told me about when uh, the Maranoa River had deep billabongs, clean water flowing over rocks. Mm. And, mm. and that it's only been, you know, 60 years, 70 years. And that, that really came about once the big croppers turned up. Mm. Because then they just, big ploughs and D9s going across big sections of country. And that, that was the start of probably at the 40s and 50s after the Second World War. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you, Warren. Thank you. Fantastic.